Ultra Kill Act 2 has been fully released, adding tons of new content from the newly added rocket launcher to the murder and the revival of the Whiplash. Now, as a professional Cybergrind player myself, you can tell by the fact I'm a virgin. I thought I would create a guide going over game mechanics and how they apply in the cyber grind. There will be six sections to this video. Timestamps will be in the description. Fair warning, some of this guide will be opinionated, so don't take this as gospel. And with this update still being fairly new, there is tech that is likely yet to be discovered. Cool? Cool. Let's jump into it. Now, how does the cyber grind work? Because it's actually a lot more than just... Uh, uh. In Cybergrind, your goal is to take out all the enemies on the stage. As soon as every enemy on the stage has either been beaten to death, had their head blown off, or suffered nuclear annihilation, the wave resets and the layout changes to another. During this transition, all of your resources will be refilled and you will be fully healed back to 100 HP. Do note, your style and freshness will stay the same between waves, so you have to get creative with each of your wave starts. There are four enemy types in the Cybergrind. Common, Uncommon, Special, and Layout Specific, aka this fat ass. Common enemies are your standard run-of-the-mill enemies you will see every wave of the cyber grind. Uncommon enemies don't spawn as often as common enemies, hence the name. When they do spawn, only one kind of uncommon enemy will spawn in that wave, meaning you won't see a sentry and a virtue in the same wave. Special enemies have unique spawn conditions. They can't begin spawning until about wave 10, although technically wave 16, but whatever, and have a spawn cap of 1, meaning you won't see more than one special enemy in a wave. But every 10 waves, this cap increases, so by wave 20, you could see two special enemies, and by wave 30, you could see three special enemies, and by wave 40, you could... you get the picture. When special enemies spawn, the number of them that spawns dictates the number of waves special enemies cannot spawn. So if two special enemies spawn on wave 24, I won't see any special enemies till wave 27 at the minimum. Finally, we have layout-specific enemies, that being this fella. And that's it. We'll go over the hideous mask more later, but for now, let's just talk about his spawn conditions, which are exactly the same as special enemies, except for they are put into their own category. This means if two special enemies spawn in wave 24, a layout specific enemy could spawn in wave 24 as well, despite there being two special enemies present because hideous masses aren't considered special enemies, but spawn in the same way, if that makes sense. Now we're gonna talk about movement, baby. Ah! Movement in Ultra Kill is what determines your survival more than anything else in the cyber grind. Not just how good you can slide jump, but where you decide to slide jump in relation to your enemies. Moving around willy nilly will just result in your death. Typically, you should be putting yourself in open spaces and higher elevation as this gives you more freedom to react to incoming attacks as well as separate enemies so you can deal with them at your own pace. Ultra Kill has a large list of movement tech and I'll go over some of the more important stuff here. Slide jumping is one of the most fundamental movement techs in the game that is a must know to perform at higher level. It is performed by simply sliding, then jumping, then sliding again when you hit the ground. Chain these together and you are now B-Hop, uh, I mean, slide jumping. This will be your main traversal tool for not only Cyber Grind, but most of ultra kill. Dash jumping is closely related to slide jumping with the difference being you dash then jump instead of sliding and then jumping. Hence the name. This will give you a jump start to your movement which you can then transition the slide jumps. Slam stores, although not as useful as they were in previous versions of Cyber Grind, are still useful in some situations. They are performed by moving into the direction of a wall while pressed against it, jumping, then slamming, and while slamming, jumping off the wall you're pressed against. This will give you normal air movement while still being under the effects of air slams, which means if you jump immediately after hitting the ground, you... Conversely, if you slide instead of jumping, you will get sent flying forward. Originally, the main use this had in Cybergrind was to give you a favorable round start. By being in the air, you had time to deal with some enemies, such as mind flares before landing, and the enemies below would often kill each other before you landed. This is far less viable now, as enemies such as Virtues and Sentries can hit you from pretty much anywhere on the map, and being far up in the air makes it hard to take out these enemies before they shoot you out of the air like it's Duck Hunt. Next are overpump jumps, which were also less useful as of this update. Overpumps aren't only good for taking out larger groups of enemies, but can also be used for player movement. The main methods for returning to the stage when out in the void were either by whiplashing or blowing yourself up. To perform overpump jumps, simply pump the green variant shotguns three times, look down, and boom, you killed yourself because you were below 50 HP. Next is the rocket launcher, and specifically rocket jumps and rocket rides. If you've played any arena shooter, you know what a rocket jump is. To perform these, simply look down at the ground, jump, and then immediately after jumping, shoot the ground your dumb face is currently looking at. Specifically in Ultra Kill, rockets that collide with anything that isn't an enemy will still have an explosive knockback, but will deal no damage, so you don't have to worry about taking self-damage while using this, unlike other methods. 
Rock jumps are pretty versatile in their uses, so experiment and see what else you can do with them. Then there are rocket rides, which even after being nerfed in the previous patch are still pretty OP. There are several methods of performing a rocket ride, but what I consider to be the most viable is to look down at about a 40 degree angle, dash to reset your air momentum, fire a rocket, and then freeze it shortly after. Rocket riding has the main purpose of providing offstage movement, which is extremely useful in Cybergrind. Large group of swords machines chasing you? Well, jump off stage, slap them up a bit, and then fly all the way to the other side. Did three mind flares spawn the same wave some sentries did? Jump off stage and fight them down there in the void. Want to go fetch some milk at the store? Rock it right all the way there. As of the most recent patch, after performing three consecutive rocket rides, the fourth will have diminishing returns, meaning the rocket won't fly as good. But as soon as you touch grass, your rockets will go back to flying normal. Rocket riding is very useful in Cybergrind, and you should take the time to incorporate it into your gameplay. Next we will go over weapons and their most optimal uses in the Cybergrind. The revolver will be your all-around weapon you will use frequently. There are two variants of the revolver, the piercer, a beam shot that deals more damage and pierces through enemies, and the marksman, which grants you the ability to toss a coin in the air and shoot it, deflecting the shot to the nearest enemy weak spot. Coin toss has a load of other uses, which if I were to go over, it would make this video take hours, so it won't, but just know it's very versatile. There's an alternate version of the revolver called the slab revolver, which deals more damage but sports a lower fire rate. There's a debate as to which variant works with either the alt or the standard revolver, but in my personal opinion, the alt revolver works better with the piercer as it does more damage, giving it multifunctional use for taking out larger enemies with the beam and dealing with smaller enemies with the weapon's primary fire. Whereas the marksman works better with standard as its higher fire rate allows you to fire off more coins faster while having a damage increase that compares to the slab revolver. Since a coin toss applies a damage multiplier to ricochet shots. One could make an argument for using piercer on standard as the beam shot charges faster, but in return you have less damage. But if you use the slab with the marksman, you belong in an asylum. The shotgun is your primary damage dealer, being able to take out malicious faces in two shots point blank. The shotgun has two variants, the core eject and the pump charge. Core eject fires a grenade type thing which explodes once it collides with anything. If the core eject is shot mid-air, it will create a bigger explosion with its damage being increased depending on the weapon that you use. This is great for dealing mass damage and taking out larger enemies at once, especially when using the malicious rail cannon, which is something you will be spamming a lot. A new, a new, a new. The pump charge allows you to pump the next shot of your shotgun, with each pump increasing its damage while increasing its spread. On the third pump, however, the shotgun becomes overpumped, and when it fires, it creates a large explosion at the barrel of the gun. This can be used to deal large damage to a group of enemies, or fling the player using the knockback. When using the overpump, if you want to avoid the damage while still damaging other enemies, dash at the same time you shoot, as the dash has invincibility frames so you won't eat shit. The shotgun has the fastest DPS in the game due to its fast swap to and from time, allowing you to switch between its variants quickly and fire the weapon each swap. To perform a shotgun swap, simply shoot the shotgun, press the change variation button, which by default is bound to E, then shoot again. You can also parry shotgun pellets using a technique called projectile boosting. With the blue arm, if you punch right after shooting, the shotgun pellets will turn into an explosive projectile. These do slightly more damage than the rocket launcher while being harder to perform. Next is the nail gun. The nail gun is a bolt hose that sprays nails at its enemies. The nail gun has two variants. The attractor variant shoots a magnet for the alt fire that can attach to any surface, including enemies. This magnet will attract the bullets from the nail gun to it, creating a swarm of bullets around it that will deal damage to enemies that touch it. The overheat variant charges up an orange meter when you fire it. When you alt fire while the meter has charged, the nail gun's DPS increases to nearly double its base DPS until the meter runs out. There is a green two bar meter on the weapon as well that depletes by one bar every time the alt fire is used, meaning no space Bamsies for you! The nail gun does have an alternate, that being the saw blade launcher that fires saw blades instead of nails, hence the name. But other than that, the weapon is functionally the same. Wait, hold up, pause. This is a uh, post recording Skeletal Blood here. I just wanted to say there's actually a bit more to the saw blade launcher. For one, it has higher damage, its shots pierce enemies, the shots ricochet off walls, and the magnet functions a little differently. Also, the overheat functions a little differently, where instead of increasing the weapon's DPS, the overheat then shoots out a flaming saw blade that'll light enemies on fire, sometimes multi-hit them, and deal more damage overall. But other than that, it's pretty much the same. Now, can I be honest for a moment? 
the nail gun kind of sucks. I can already hear the keyboards of the nail gun users being slammed and abused as they write their copium-induced rebuttals in the comments. But hear me out. What the nail gun can do, every other weapon in the game can do significantly better. Need to take out a malicious face? Just use the shotgun instead. It's faster, grants more meter, etc, etc. Need to take out a group of enemies? Just use core eject nuke. As it is, again, faster and grants more meter. This is also one of the few weapons in the game with limited ammo that has to recharge after using it, which does not make sense considering it's one of the weakest weapons in the game. The only viable use I have seen for this weapon at top level play is taking out groups of malicious faces, which even the shotgun swaps are far more effective at even if the enemy is in a large group. Are they more risky to take on when they are in groups? Yes, but in the theoretical most optimal level of play, that doesn't matter. Overall, I feel this weapon doesn't have a unique identity in the Cyber Grind, with it being outshined by other weapons in the game. So, um... Please buff. Next is the Rail Cannon, a huge beam cannon that deals massive damage while in return having a long cooldown. The Rail Gun has three variants. Electric, which fires with a standard beam that deals massive damage and pierces enemies. The Screwdriver, which fires a drill that once it connects to its enemies deals damage over time and increases their blood drop rate. And the Malicious variant, which fires an explosive shot with a large explosion radius similar to the charge shot of the Malicious face. Two of these are really useful, and one makes it take longer for me to swap between the two useful ones. Yeah, don't use this thing. One important tip is that the malicious variant, when combined with the core eject shot, has a significantly larger damage radius and deals more damage. Finally, we have the Rocket Launcher, the newest addition to the Cyber Grind. Rocket Launcher pays tribute to the days of past, firing rockets that deal big damage while having a large damage radius. Any rockets that directly hit an airborne enemy do extra damage, while rockets that hit inanimate surfaces deal no damage but still have knockback, allowing you to pop up your enemies in the air. Rocket Launcher currently only has one variant, that being the freeze frame. When alt firing, any rockets that are fired will stop in place. While a rocket is frozen, the player can jump onto the rocket, being able to ride it and steer it as it moves. Being able to rocket ride is again important for Cybergrind as it allows for offstage play that otherwise is far more difficult to perform. It is important to be able to use most of your arsenal as it is directly tied to your style meter, which as of this patch has a direct effect on your health. How exactly does it work? Good question, I don't really know. I just know big boom make number go big burr. Style meter is a measurement of how well you are performing as well as how technical your performance is. Every kill you get will add to your style meter and how technically impressive that kill is determines how much the style meter will fill up. They aren't too dissimilar from awards in games like Call of Duty, Halo, or Quake. Combo kill. The more awards you get, the higher your rank goes, with the highest rank being Ultra Kill. Whoa, that's... That's like the title of the game, no way! Oh. You also lose meter when performing poorly by either taking damage or using the same weapon for too long. As of the most recent update, your rank will directly correlate with how long it takes for hard damage to decay. What is hard damage? It acts as a temporary health cap that appears on your health bar in the form of gray health when you either take too much damage or use the whiplash. Part of your style meter is the freshness meter. Freshness meter is directly attached to your weapon usage. For every successful use of the weapon, the freshness meter, which applies an increase on style points, goes down. Soon the meter can hit times zero, meaning the uses of your weapon will yield zero style. Different uses of your weapon will have different levels of decay on the freshness meter. For example, a headshot from a standard revolver lowers your freshness of meter by about one fourth with a coin toss lowering it about half. This is different for every weapon, so it wouldn't hurt to experiment. The way you approach enemies in Cybergrind is pretty different from how you should approach enemies in the main game, with some enemies in the main game being more or less threatening in the Cybergrind. Now it's hard to gauge the threat level of some enemies in the Cybergrind. That's why we have a tier list. My tier list ranks the enemies from least threatening to most threatening, and I will go through them in order, starting with the fodder tier. The fodder tier are enemies that barely pose a threat to the player and are best kept alive to serve as free health. Filth is a common enemy with melee attack range with it only being able to bite the player. The filth is one of the fastest enemies in the game but is also one of the weakest, being dealt with easily by using a single knuckle duster shockwave. Not much to make note of with this enemy as in later waves it will usually die to the hands of swords machines, malicious faces, and pretty much every other enemy in the game rather than the player. 
What are you doing in here? I said don't come in here when we're recording. I'm wearing my Simpsons shirt. Next we have schisms, a common enemy that spray projectiles wildly in either a vertical or horizontal motion. This enemy sports a decent amount of HP while lacking mobility being one of the slower enemies in the game. Best dealt with by using a whiplash and two shotgun combo. You will typically see this enemy at the very end of your wave, just barely catching up with you as you finish slaughtering the rest of their friends. Martin? You there? Y you still mad? <laughs> strays are the base projectile throwers of the game. Strays lack any sort of close range attack, and when the player approaches them, they will flee in fear. They are best dealt with by either using a standard revolver headshot or slab revolver shot anywhere on the body. One thing to note when dealing with the stray, soldier, or even the schism is that they have a charge to their projectile before firing. The charging of the projectile becomes a weak spot, that when you shoot it, explodes, killing them instantly. Finally, at the top of the fodder tier is the drone. Drones hover in the air and shoot a tri projectile. They can also dodge around to avoid getting hit. Best dealt with using the slab revolver shot. They can also be one punched by the red hand, which sends them flying in the direction you punch them, and anything the drone collides with will cause it to explode. Although this is fun to do, sadly it's not optimal as if an enemy throws a projectile at the drone while you're attempting to punch it, it'll just explode in your face. Next is the ignore tier. These enemies are still not likely to kill the player or threaten their run in any way, but have more health and are just difficult to kill in general, making them not useful as fodder. First is the soldier, a common enemy that functions very similarly to the stray. The soldier fires five projectiles in a single shot, making it harder to dodge or parry. Instead of running away when in close quarters, the soldier has a flash kick to deter the player. Soldiers are best dealt with using the slab revolver. One trait the soldier has is being immune to explosive damage, with the exception being red explosives. Next are the street sweepers, aka the pyro from TF2, which TF2 would shamelessly steal from Ultra Kill 13 years prior. You can't keep getting away with it! They attack by holding down W plus M1, but lack the range or speed to keep up with the player. Street sweepers play a more supportive role as they're able to deflect projectiles such as core ejects and rockets, and can dodge attacks such as the railgun or whiplash, although they kinda suck at it. This makes the enemies around them stronger as the attacks you throw at them will be nullified by their defensive tools. They are best dealt with by tossing a coin behind them and shooting it, hitting the fuel tank attached to their back causing it to explode. Swords machines are the lamest enemies in the game. There. I said it. I know it's a hard pill to swallow, but somebody had to say it. For an enemy that's kind of hyped up in the prelude of the game, it's kind of sad that they're so weak in the cyber grind, but I digress. This common enemy attacks by swinging its sword at the player, which can be easily parried, while also shooting at the player with a shotgun. Once they endure enough damage, they go into a knockdown state where they lose their arm and are vulnerable. Still alive after this, they will go into their second phase, where they continue the swing at the player while gaining some new attacks. 90% of which leave him open to taking damage, making him weaker in his second phase, but okay. Services are slow, tanky common enemies with an array of different attacks. They have a stomp that sends out a shockwave, a shoulder bash, and a projectile throw which sends an orb at you at high speed. If the player saves moving and in the air, Cerberus pose little threat to the player, but be careful as the Cerberus will become enraged if another is to die, making them faster. Best dealt with by using the rocket launcher as they take 50% extra damage from rockets. You can also use double coin toss combo to instantly kill them, but in my opinion that's a little wasteful. At the top of the ignore tier, and our first special enemy, is the Ferryman, which is essentially just a glorified swords machine. What a shame, what a shame. Ferrymen suffer from the same flaws as the swords machine of only being able to hit the player whilst they're on the ground. To make up for this, the Ferryman has some attacks that cannot be parried and increased mobility, allowing the Ferryman to chase the player around the layout. The Ferryman can also use a tracking thunderstrike attack, similarly to the Virtue, and although this is easier to dodge, it does far more damage, taking about 50 HP. This is the only good move the Ferryman has. The ferryman is best dealt with by using the rocket launcher or projectile boosting while in the air. Next is the Threatening tier. These enemies do pose a threat to your run and should either be avoided or taken out quickly. First is the Idol. The Idol cannot attack the player directly, but does make the strongest enemy and closest enemy to the player intangible. Idols can be dealt with by either punching them, slamming them, or using the Knuckle Blaster Shockwave. Once they are destroyed, they will create a shockwave, sending the player...
Next is the Stalker. The Stalker doesn't directly attack the player, but instead applies a buff to nearby enemies by covering them in sand, preventing the enemy from dropping blood. In doing this, they sacrifice themselves, dying as soon as the sand tank on their back explodes. Best dealt with using the rocket launcher to launch the enemy in the air, then shooting them with either the revolver or a rocket air shot if you're feeling fancy. Finally, we have the Sentry, one of the most threatening uncommon enemies in the game. Except for one. Sentries lock onto the player with a laser sight, tracking the player as long as they have line of sight. Eventually, they will shoot the player, dealing 50 damage and applying great health instantly. Sentries turn the typical optimal positioning for the player on its head. With instead of sticking to open areas in the air, the player is forced to sneak cover in crammed low elevation positions, allowing other enemies to have an advantage. This enemy's presence alone turns the tides of any cyber grind wave. They are best dealt with using the rocket launcher as they are easy to juggle in the air with air rockets. Use the revolver to interrupt their tracking by shooting their antenna, buying the player more time in the open. Next is the run ender category. These enemies should be near the top of your list of enemies to obliterate as soon as possible, as these guys could very well do the same to you. You. First are Malicious Faces, one of the most threatening common enemies in the whole game. This enemy has two attacks. One is a burst of projectiles, with the other being a death beam that will rob you of 50 HP and launch you in the air for one of those Dragon Ball Z air combos. This death beam is the most threatening part of the Malicious Face, whilst also being one of the biggest weaknesses of the Malicious Face, as this attack has a long charge time that can be parried. This beam cannon also straight up cannot hit the player while they're in the air, with the beam only creating an explosion when hitting a surface. This means you should try your best to stay on high ground and in open spaces when facing Malicious Faces. Thus dealt with using the Whiplash shotgun swabs as they will die in about 3 shots. Next are the Insurrectionist, a big body special enemy that swings the head of a malicious face at the player while stomping around, creating shockwaves at the same time. All of the Insurrectionist swings are parryable and can be used to deflect the head back at the Insurrectionist, leaving them open for big damage. The swings are also pretty easy to avoid due to their slow speed and the attack being very telegraphed beforehand. Best dealt with using Core Eject plus Malicious Cannon to cause big damage and light them on fire, and then spamming them with Shotgun Swaps or Rocket Launcher until they die. At the very top of the threatening tier is the Mind Flare, which is basically just a Dragon Ball Z character. Hey, it's me, Goku! The Mind Flare is one of the most threatening special enemies in the game. This is because the Mind Flare can teleport, making it very difficult to escape, as it will always teleport closer to the player. The Mind Flayer is also an airborne enemy, meaning she herself is harder to hit without putting yourself at risk by using something such as a Whiplash. She has Tracking Key Blast, uh, I mean, projectiles, a Kamehameha, and a Teleports Behind You Nothing Personal Kid melee attack. As of this update, the Mind Flayer is easier to fight than when she was first introduced, as tools such as the Whiplash and Rocket Launcher allowed the player to compete with her air movement. The Rocket Launcher and Knuckle Blasters are great counters to her projectiles, as they will knock them back with their shockwaves. Whiplash allows you to get close to her while offstage to perform big damage with weapons such as the shotgun. Finally, we have the Ultra Kill Must Die tier. If these enemies ever spawn, they must be killed immediately before anything else, except for the idol, but that really doesn't count. I mean, come on, it would be really dumb if this dude was an S tier, bro, come on. First, we have the Hideous Mass. The Hideous Ass shoots massive tracking projectiles up into the air that have a large explosive radius and big damage. It can also create horizontal and vertical shockwaves, but its most dangerous attack of all is the Harpoon. Once it comes in contact with the player, it will immobilize them, which, as you can imagine, would be a very stressful situation to be in at wave 15 and beyond. <laughs> now, the ass wouldn't be in this tier if it weren't for the fact that the layouts it shows up on happen to be some of the most difficult layouts in all of Cybergrind, with one in particular being a near guaranteed game over with the wrong enemy spawns. Most of its attacks are actually pretty easy to dodge and can be countered in some way, and even its health pool isn't massive, with a simple double coin toss rail combo instantly killing them. But remember, this isn't a how dangerous this enemy is in general tier list, because if it was, it would be massively different. This is a how dangerous is this enemy in Cybergrind tier list, where there are tons of enemies attacking you at once, and at any moment you could be fighting three bosses in one wave. <laughs> The mask can spawn on three of the 18 Cybergrind layouts, with one of those being a cakewalk, while the other two slam that cake in your face. These two layouts are far more difficult as the max spawn limit for masses on these are two instead of one, so instant killing them leaves the other alive and you without a railgun. By the time you kill the first one, the rest of enemies have already spawned as well, meaning you have to fight through them in order to get to the other mass. 
Although this certainly isn't a checkmate situation, depending on the other enemy spawns, it can become very difficult very quickly. The other enemy in the top tier is the Virtue. Now, to some this may seem like an odd pick. This guy? It's an uncommon enemy with a tracking light beam that is annoying, but it ain't too bad. Yes, by itself it's not so bad, but here's the thing. Uncommon waves can either spawn a few uncommon enemies, or an entire army of them. Imagine trying to take out 8 virtue beams while also dealing with 2 mind flares and an insurrectionist all well offstage. No matter where you are, they will always be attacking you. And on top of that, they fly too, so they aren't easy to attack either. They also take knockback when they are hit for some reason, so even when you are close to them, it's still hard to keep them pinned down. At earlier waves, virtues are not nearly as threatening as at most you could be dealing with one or two special enemies. But in later waves, the added bombardment from Virtues can end runs pretty quickly. Now some of you may be saying, Well, the Sentry and Idol also add extra bombardment onto the player's plate. Why are they ranked so low in comparison? Glad you asked, Virgin Viewer. That is because there is counterplay to both of these enemies, whereas your only choice to deal with Virtues is to take them out at wave start. Sentries can be interrupted and are limited to attacking the player when they have line of sight. The idol admittedly does also put the player into a do or die situation similar to the Virtue, but the difference is the idol can be taken out fairly quickly, and it is far easier to just ignore enemies such as Mind Flayers or Insurrectionists whilst dealing with it. Meanwhile, if 8 Virtues are on stage, dealing with them whilst dealing with 3 Specials is pretty difficult. I will die on this hill. The Virtue is one of the most threatening enemies in the Cyber Grind. Until the Hideous Mask gets 2 more layouts, with one having a spawn camp of 4. Yeah! Oh, hideous Mask, let's go! Yeah! Next we'll go over some strategies real fast. In Cybergrind you want to have a high style meter at all times, and the best ways to gain style meter are by using nukes, projectile boost, and instant kills such as double coin tosses or mind flare instant kill. Use these methods to stay life longer as a higher style meter means higher survivability. Speaking of instant kills, the railgun is a highly valuable resource in the Cybergrind, but when used incorrectly, you will not get anything out of it. Typically it should be used to perform nukes or take out threatening enemies such as mind flares, insurrections, or masses. As for positioning in the cyber grind, high ground is valuable with the only other safe place being off stage, which by around like wave 50, you're just going to be off stage like 90% of the time anyway. Um, other than that though, that's really all there is to getting into cyber grind. I could be a lot more specific with my knowledge, but at that point, I think I'd just be telling people to play how I play as opposed to playing their own unique ways and playing with their own unique play styles. That's basically the video. If you're thirsty for any more knowledge, the wiki fandom page is a great place to look. Uh, I'll link that in the description. And just playing the game, naturally over time you'll get good at stuff. So just keep playing and watching gameplay as well. I'll link Quake Quack's channel in the description below. He plays, um, he on occasion will upload like Wave 100 footage, which is really crazy. He's super good at the game. And then I'm also going to be starting a second channel where I upload just straight gameplay as well. Um, I will link that in the description. I should have some Cyber Grind PBs on there already. I'll probably be uploading just random gameplay footage other than Ultra Kill as well. So expect like TF2, some fighting games in there. But um, yeah, thanks for watching this video. I know that this guide probably was a little all over the place and whatnot. It took me about three weeks, four weeks to put this whole thing together, so I've been working on it for a really long time, and I'm really glad I've been finally able to get it out the door, because there's tons of other stuff I want to work on in the meantime. Hope you enjoyed. If you have any questions um, or anything else you want to know, leave a comment down below. I am totally willing to answer your question about any any questions about Cybergrind or Ultra Kill in general. I can answer them. Leave them in the comments. I will I will get to that the moment, the mo not the moment, but as soon as I can, <laughs> moment you comment it. But thank you so much for watching this video. If you want more, you know, uh, like, subscribe, that kind of thing. And I will see you guys on the next video. Bye. Well, it's... Ah... Uh, ah... Uh.